I have to ask, how do you take your coffee? I drink my coffee straight and black. If it's not good enough to drink black, it's not good enough coffee. <laughs> well, it depends on the time of the day. I'm not really super fussy, I guess, but you know, I'll drink a milky coffee in the morning, but generally I like straight filter coffee. No milk, no sugar. Oh my gosh, how do I take my coffee? I take my coffee over to my neighbor or a friend because I don't even like Oh coffee. my gosh. I don't even like coffee. It is shocking. But that's the thing, you know, you don't have to be a coffee drinker to care about this issue we're talking about today of how climate is impacting coffee. I can't get through the day without at least two strong cups of coffee. And I take it with the tiniest whisper of milk. And it isn't just me. In the U.S. alone, an estimated 66% of adults drink coffee every day. Technically, coffee is a luxury, right? It provides nothing that human beings need nutritionally. But to many coffee drinkers, it feels essential. Global coffee culture is deeply ingrained in our daily lives, from Los Angeles to Osaka. And for millions of coffee farmers around the world, it is essential, providing a crucial source of income that is increasingly under threat. Like so many other crops we grow, coffee is seriously threatened by climate change. It's a delicate plant, and all around the world, the land on which it can be grown is shrinking. If things continue as they are, the stuff we buy at the store could become very expensive, or very bland, or even disappear from our lives altogether. I'm Gabrielle Sierra, and this is Why It Matters. Today, will climate change take coffee off the menu? If you're watching us with your first cup of coffee, take note. A warming planet could make that drink harder to find. Your morning cup of joe could become a thing of the past. Experts say the main bean used to make coffee is drying up. Coffee drinkers out there, I am feeling your pain on this one. No matter how you like your coffee, the coffee bean may be going At the moment, 50% of the areas that we currently grow coffee in will be severely impacted by climate change by 2050 to the point of becoming probably uneconomic to grow coffee in. So it's a massive challenge for the coffee industry. This is Jonathan Morris. He's a coffee historian. Yep, those exist. And he's a professor at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK. And what he just mentioned is bad news because we consume a lot of coffee. The world drinks about 500 billion cups of coffee a year. And with 80% of coffee grown by 25 million small farmers, that means a lot of people stand to lose their way of making a living. So in coffee, you've got the environmental challenges, both the challenges involved in climate change, but also the challenges of coffee growing per se mm -hmm. and its impact on the environment. You've got the economic challenges, particularly the challenges of a trading market. And you've got what I would call the social challenges, which move mm -hmm. beyond the economic to sort of, you know, how do we want our societies to look? How do we want to help particular societies survive? Those kinds of things. And how do we help them transition as well? Because transitioning into a place of more profitability is actually a difficult thing to do. And that dilemma is particularly important in the world's biggest coffee-producing nations. Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, Indonesia, and Ethiopia. 125 million people worldwide depend on coffee for their livelihoods. This is Amanda Grassi. She works at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University in New York City. So this could be farmers, roasters, sellers, and pretty much anyone involved in the coffee value chain. So it's a lot of people. And a surprising number of those people are women. Globally, women operate about 20 to 30 percent of coffee farms and represent uh, up to 70 percent of the labor force in coffee. Mm -hmm. So empowering women financially has benefits beyond themselves to also, you know, that of their families and especially their children. Right. So there's this social and women's empowerment aspect. But, you know, not only is coffee, you know, a key source of income for these millions of people, but because of this, it's actually critically important for addressing issues of food security mm -hmm. in many vulnerable contexts. So I'm not saying it's important because people, you know, need to eat or drink coffee. I'm saying the use of the income they get from selling the coffee, you know, which is a cash crop, to buy food, to keep themselves from going hungry, to feed their families, and ultimately keep themselves food secure and nourished is very important. 
and that this is the case for millions of people around the world. All right, before we go any further, let's go back to basics. How is coffee farmed? Can you quickly outline for me the path from, you know, farm to table? How is coffee made? So there are supposedly 25 stages in that. Okay. I'll try and simplify <laughs> a little bit, okay? Yeah. So look, when we start by what we call a coffee tree, it's really a bush. It's probably about eight to 10 meters high. That has a fruit, which we call a cherry. When the cherry turns red, we pick that fruit. Inside the fruit are the seeds. They're what we now call the beans. Once we have taken off the fruit, dried out the seeds, we take the beans and hull them. So we knock off the kind of the parchment surrounding them. And at that point, they are then traded through various ways, through various middlemen. They get to a shipping point and are then shipped over to the final country, consumer country. There they're roasted and then those coffee beans can be sold and prepared in the multiple ways that we prepare coffee. For 25 steps, that was very (laughs) succinct. Coffee has been a part of daily life for generations. But in recent years, it's emerged as a massive and lucrative industry, serving discerning customers who are willing to pay a lot for bougie brews. Heck, Starbucks is a multi-billion dollar company. Sure, there are some like me who drink their coffee lukewarm and days old. But for others, coffee has become a passion. The United States Barista Championship is less than one week away at this point, which is very, very exciting. Welcome to another episode of Coffee Fusion. This week we're going to look at Latte Art Basics. As you're pouring, the milk is coming out of the pitcher and into the coffee, and when it's too high, it sinks. But when you back down, it's just the right point. And as this interest increases, coffee itself faces a crisis. Clearly, more than ever, people love their fine coffee. But no matter how you take it, the quality of the end product starts back at the farm with the first of those 25 steps. And that brings us to the beans. So look, there are two types of commercially used coffee at the moment, or very much two sort of dominant ones. One is the original coffee plant that we've always used. It's called Arabica coffee. Ironic because it's actually originally from Africa, but we first came across it in Arabia. Arabica coffee is more vulnerable to climate change. It's very sensitive to excessive heat, but it's also, as all coffee plants are, incapable of surviving anywhere where there's frost. Mm. It's a little like, if you like, wine in the sense that Arabica coffee can assume a lot of flavor profiles from the way that it's grown, all these kind of things, very, very specific. There is another form of coffee, somewhat cheaper, somewhat hardier. It's called Robusta coffee commonly. It's still completely sensitive to frost. It's slightly hardier in terms of temperature, and it's much better in disease resistance. It doesn't, by and large, taste as good. Tasting notes are not so clear. But the biggest difference between the two is that the Robusta coffee has about twice the caffeine of the Arabica coffee. Whoa. So, um, yeah, if you're drinking a Robusta blend, you're getting significantly more caffeine in there. What better way to understand this than by trying it out? One of our producers, Rafaela Seward, gave me a blind taste test. So we had one cup of Arabica, one cup of Robusta, and one that's a blend. And we wanted to see if I could really tell the difference. I thought I could. Put this phone here. Uh, yeah. Are we sure it's good? Okay. I think so. Yep. Cool. Welcome to my world. <laughs> okay. So we are here in our office in New York, and I am sitting at the table with my producer, Rafaela. Hello. And I am about to endure a blind taste test of different types of coffee. That's right. I have never done a coffee tasting. I've done wine tasting. Okay. Scotch tasting. I've done, yes, I've done a whiskey tasting. Whiskey, I'm it. seeing a theme. I'm very excited to administer. We I'm have, excited. You're going to taste each and do a little guessing and see if you can tell the differences. I think I can tell. You think? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we have them in three identical Council on Foreign Relations mugs. Yes. So I have no idea which they are. Totally black coffee. Sorry, no whispers of milk. <laughs> All right, so let's start. Here is your first cup. Okay. So take a first sip. Oh, wow. Okay, this is like very taste forward. Mm. Is that something that you say with coffee? Fashion forward, taste forward. (laughs) You know, smells good. And it's a little bitter, but you know, it's coffee. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Next cup. Okay, second cup, here we go. Ooh, funny, this one really doesn't have as much of a smell. First impressions. Wow, much smoother, not bitter. Mm. This one, the first one was absolutely a bitter coffee. Interesting. Yeah. Third right. one. Okay, this one is like a little, a little bitter. Okay, so here's here's what I think. Okay. Blend. Yes. Arabica. Mm -hmm. Robusta. You mixed Arabica and Robusta. What? Yes. No way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Joke's on me. <laughs> well, this is telling to the coffee industry that some of us like Robusta more. Yeah. And it's better. I will say, like, you can taste more, like, it's a stronger flavor in the Arabica. Like, it tastes yeah. like a taste as opposed to Robusta does remind me of like a more mild, mm -hmm. like a comforting sort of dinery coffee right? versus, you know. Something, something... really homey about a dinery yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah. And then, oh, I got the blend. Okay. You did get wow, the blend. I got this so wrong. All so right. what's the takeaway? How do you, what do we think about this? This is, I, I, I'm rethinking all of my t coffee choices. Well, you know what? It's in your best interest because I think that's the one that's going to stick around a little longer in the climate crisis. That's perfect. So, so <laughs> you're yeah. good. The rest yeah. of us, I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> If we could go back just a step, could you break down how the two major elements of climate change, you know, temperature and extreme weather, will affect coffee production? Basically, as we hit higher temperatures, the plant's yield goes down. Mm. Yeah. So it won't be a kind of an all or nothing moment. You won't just see coffee dying, but what you'll see is reduced yields. And as the yields reduce at a certain point, obviously, it becomes uneconomic to produce the coffee. This is important because coffee crops don't have to utterly fail in a region in order to disappear. They just have to become so difficult to grow that farmers give up and move on to another livelihood. As temperatures increase, farms produce fewer and lower quality beans, pushing them closer to crisis. Brazil is the world's leader in coffee production and bad weather last year, including drought and frost, has left farmers there with much less crop than usual. And a number of big coffee shops, large and small, have upped their prices. And now those prices are set to climb even higher. The average price for a pound of coffee today is $6.11. A year ago, it was $4.56. Extreme climate change in Brazil that have massively impacted the coffee price recently is frost. So if there's a frost and it kills off coffee plants, then you have a real problem because it takes five years to get those plants back productive. So that's five years with no income. So yeah. maybe you can do that if you're a big plantation and you have a nice reserve, but you can't do that as a small yeah, farmer. It's a long time. Yeah. And so the disaster in Brazil was followed by a drought disaster. <laughs> So it's about the two worst things that could happen. If there isn't enough rain, there's no flowering. If there isn't enough rain, there's no sort of maturing of the coffee cherry in the right way. Without mitigation and adaptation, events like Brazil's crop failure due to both frost and drought are going to happen more often, more intensely, and in more places. All over the world, it will be too hot or too cold. There will be too much water or too little to grow the crops that we are all used to. At the same time, extreme weather will also increase the prevalence of plant disease. And it's not just a particular crop or year, but the existence of certain coffee species altogether. This is of particular concern in Ethiopia, which is one of the world's most important coffee regions. What if I told you that Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee, right? The origin of coffee and the world's main storehouse of genetic diversity for Arabica coffee, and that furthermore, this is under threat due to climatic changes, and that this is going to affect the taste of your coffee. <laughs> oh no, I think yeah. some people just had a heart attack. So, you know, coffee that ripens faster, such as with higher temperatures, actually has less time to develop complex flavor profiles. Mm. According to some research, rising temperatures and decreasing rainfall could actually render as much as 60% of Ethiopia's coffee growing areas unsuitable for cultivation by the end of the century. Wow. So from a conservation standpoint, the entire genetic diversity of indigenous or wild Arabica coffee is confined mainly 
in this Afro-Montane rainforest that's located in the west and east of this Great Rift Valley that's called in Africa. So Ethiopian coffee genetic materials are really important for these different flavor profiles that I just talked about, mm -hmm. but also in breeding programs, they're producing these high productivity and disease resistant coffee varieties around the world. So what can be done? Well, obviously, as always, we need to mitigate, but we can also adapt. And for that, there are three primary options. One of those is to move coffee, mm -hmm. move it to somewhere cooler, wetter. And in somewhere like Ethiopia, moving up in elevation, up a mountain, does give you quite a degree of resilience. This is Aaron Davis. He's a senior research leader of crops and global change at Kew Royal Botanic Gardens. Basically, he's a top scientist studying crops within the context of climate change. But moving coffee comes at a cost because it's difficult moving people, it's difficult moving crops. So there are all sorts of social and economic considerations in play there. Now, the second option is to modify the farm. At the farm, solutions are really, really, really important. One of the easiest and most effective things that you can do as a climate smart practice with coffee is to have shade grown coffee because when you have a tree, you know, it helps to regulate the temperature of your coffee farm. Actually, measures like this are already being implemented. Building out a tree canopy over your coffee crop is a way to keep them shaded naturally throughout longer and hotter seasons. It's actually called agroforestry, and we're seeing this in effect in countries like Ethiopia. But I mean, beyond temperatures, we're also talking about, you know, impacts with rain, sometimes too little rain, sometimes too much rain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, too much rain, you can do things like terracing for coffee or what we might call, you know, cuvetting, changing the earth works and soil around the coffee plant to make sure, you know, when it does rain, the plant is able to harvest that water and trap that water efficiently for its growth. And if it's not raining enough, for example, you can do things like cover crops and mulching and things like this. So I'll say there's a lot of different things that you can do. And a lot of them are really quite simple, but you know, they do have a cost tied to them. If you're planting a tree or if you're needing to pay someone, you know, even more labor to work on a farm because it's hotter outside and you're not making enough money to begin with, this seemingly, you know, minimal cost ends up actually adding up to be quite a lot. They're having to increase their labor, they're having to increase their material inputs and things like this, but at the end of the day, you know, if this extra effort they're putting in for adaptation is not reflected in price, you're talking about not fully supporting the profitability of farmers and their sustainability in the long run. Right. It's not just up to the farmers to oh. save us all. No, it's really not. It's really not. So these big coffee companies, you know, Starbucks, Nespresso, et cetera, all these big coffee companies should be investing money back into research and, you know, not only research, but profits as well back into implementing climate smart practices and supporting solutions that are actually actionable to acknowledge that there is a cost associated with these climate changes and variability and help us to internalize those costs so that farmers don't have to do that. But we definitely have the resources. And I think what we need is some more research and a more will and some more people, you know, implementing these actually meaningful solutions. A solution must include a marriage of private sector investment in new technology and carry through to governmental policies that then incentivize and support farmers as they experiment and transition. All of that said, there is also one last option, starting from scratch, kind of. The third option is to change the crop itself. So adopt a different species other than Arabica or Robusta that's mm. more tolerant of higher temperatures and lower rainfalls. I mean, one of the good bits of news for coffee sustainability is the fact that we've got another 128 species. Oh, all right. <laughs> And within that species diversity, there are some useful species that could help us mm. adapt coffee farming at least to mid-century and perhaps a little bit beyond. The main focus is on those species that were cultivated at scale maybe 100, 150 years ago, almost made it as crop plants, and that might work today under accelerated climate change. Mm. 
Hmm. And we have like three or four really good candidates in that group. So how come these didn't stick before? It's not a great analogy, but I guess it's a bit like electric cars. Mm. Invented over 100 years ago. It was several models 100 years ago, but really didn't stick because there was no need for them. Why do you need an electric car when you've got plenty of hydrocarbon? But electric cars are coming into the fore now, of course. And I think that's the same with coffee. And what you see, if you look at the history of coffee, is that innovation and replacement only really takes a hold when there's a crisis. Mm. The main focus of the work we're doing right now is on Liberica. The other is Stenophylla coffee, which is an interesting species in that it, like Liberic, it was grown and exported at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and then disappeared because Robusta came along. But it grows and crops in a substantially warmer environment, up to 6.8 degrees Celsius warmer. That's the mean annual temperature. The world might be on fire, but those coffee plants, they'll well, keep going. <laughs> that, you know, that's why you need to look at the climate change projection work and work around a coffee development program that's in sync with those changes. Otherwise, it's just kind of wasting your time, I think. So there is potential to use this diversity to adapt coffee farming to climate change. But we need to start on that work <laughs> as soon as possible. In fact, we should have started 30 years ago. But we really need to move quickly because time is certainly running short. In the long term, is coffee destined to be a casualty of climate change? And if so, can science save coffee? Well, I think... <sighs> Can science save coffee? Yes and no. I think one of the key things we need to really consider is trying to minimize risk mm -hmm. for not only coffee, but for many, many other crops. If we don't do something about greenhouse gas emissions, if we aren't serious about carbon neutrality, then any of the measures that I've talked about will be inconsequential. And I really believe that. If we're to have some future for humankind, uh, let's face it, then we need to tackle climate change at its very roots. Of course, coffee is just one example. Farmers everywhere are questioning how they will grow their crops while facing a world with new climate realities. Wheat, corn, soy, wine grapes, peaches, almonds, the list goes on. And while it becomes harder and harder to farm in traditional ways, the world's population grows. That means more mouths to feed all while the world's leading scientists try to figure out how to adapt the way we grow our food. We've said it before, but this whole transition process is sticky and it's complicated. But maybe if people get shook by the idea of an empty cup of coffee, we will be motivated to make some important changes before it's too late. Our associate podcast producer, Rafaela, is leaving us for new adventures. So in honor of this, she will be reading us out. We will miss her dearly. Hi, everyone. This is Ra from The Taste Test, and I will be reading us out today since this is actually my last episode with the team, which is so bittersweet because I just love everyone so much and I'm going to miss them incredibly. Okay, here it goes. For resources used in this episode and more information, visit CFR.org slash why it matters and take a look at the show notes. If you ever have a question or any suggestions or just want to say hello, please email us at whyitmatters at CFR.org. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your audio. And if you have the time, please, please, please leave us a review. It really does help the show get noticed. And we also just love to read them. Why It Matters is a production of the Council on Foreign Relations. The show is produced by Asher Ross and Gabrielle Sierra. Our sound designer is Marcus Zacharia, and I'm Rafaela Seward, the associate podcast producer. Our intern this semester was Mormay Zanke. Robert McMahon is our managing editor, and Doug Halsey is our chief digital officer. Extra help for this episode was provided by Alyssa Fielding and Claire Klobasista. Our theme music is composed by Carrie Torhusen, and we'd also like to thank Richard Haas, Jeff Ranke, and our co-creator, Jeremy Sherlock. For Why It Matters, this is Roth, signing off. See you guys soon. They've got a zillion tons of coffee in Brazil.